Okay, we are going to start, if you would like to take your seats. Uh, right, you are the mountain, that is... Let's take a poll. Um, you don't need to share this with anybody else, so if you want to put your head down and not look around. Who wants the good news first? Hmm. Who wants the bad news first? All right, I want you to make a note of that for yourself, and we are going to circle back to why that's important. Um, we're going to do a bit of brain science first. So uh, you are the mountain. Your brain is not designed to make you happy or creative or all of the things that we really want. Your brain is not designed for that at all. Your brain is designed to keep you alive. That is it. And if you have listened to any of my previous talks, you know that I talk a lot about the amygdala, this ancient, ancient structure in the brain that is alert to any kind of threat. Um, the thing about the amygdala is it doesn't actually understand the difference between uh, an existential threat, a physical threat, and you just feeling really uneasy. It will put you into fight, fl flight, freeze, frolic, or fawn. And once you're in that space, you are no longer thinking and you are no longer putting anything into long-term memory. The minute the amygdala fires up, if you're threatened in any way, the amygdala fires up and your memory actually stops taking things in. Um, very interesting study came out of Oxford University a couple of years ago. Um, everybody should download Tetris onto their phone because it turns out that Tetris is like CPR for your brain. So if you're in some kind of, um, if you're in an accident, if something really troubling happens to you, if you start playing Tetris, the way the memory works is that kind of traumatic injury to your brain doesn't go into long-term memory. And this weird things happen where people who might have had PTSD because of this traumatic thing that happened, if they played Tetris within 24 hours of the trauma, they were much, much less likely to have flashbacks, to have anxiety attacks, to have all the things with go, that go with PTSD. So download Tetris to your phone for sure. Um, and remember that your brain is just trying to keep you alive. It is also a fucker and lies to you all the time. Um, we are going to dig pretty deep into misbelief and the voices in your head that tell you shitty things about yourself and where they come from and why you believe them. Um, there are three resources I want to point you toward. Uh, a couple of years ago, I recommended um, Jennifer Lynn Barnes, the RWA 2018 Writing for Your Id. If you haven't downloaded it, you really should. It's outstanding. It turns out she has another talk that she did that same year that they didn't label with her name, so I didn't find it until somebody else posted it, but it's called um, The Romance Writer's Guide to the Psychology of Fiction. And it isn't just for romance writers, it's about the theory of what fiction does. And I want to argue that fiction teaches us how to be human and also how to get out of our own way. So the, the misbelief in the novel, we, we narrow it down. We've got hundreds and I have thousands. We have hundreds of misbeliefs that run us. We have a grid. The way that we see the world is this grid that's made up of stories that we decided to give meaning to something. Um, we give meaning to things all the time. Your foundational misbeliefs were probably set down when you were pretty young and you still believe them. You still see the world through this grid. And one of the things we're gonna work on today is how to change that lens so you're looking through a different grid. This book, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker, if you do not own this book, you need to run, leave now, go, buy. This is the most important book I read this year. It, it really turns on, on its head the idea of um, how you become successful. It turns out that happiness comes before success. It's just a revolution. You absolutely have to read it. Um, okay, so we've got your brain. Your brain's a fucker. Your brain lies to you. You need to work out how to identify the lies and how to turn those around. And I'm going to give you some things that, that will help you do that. Um, 
One of the things that I try to model quite hard um, because I was a perfectionist and the voices in my head were perpetually telling me that I wasn't good enough um, and that I was crap and I was a hack and I couldn't do all the things that I wanted to do. Um, and so one of the things that I taught myself was uh, how to do things imperfectly. And so at the beginning of the summer, we had to get, um, I spoke at SPF London, and we had to get our slides in pretty early. And I made my slides, but I'm a pantser, so I work all the way up to the presentation. And as I get there, I realize, oh, there's about 20 slides that I'm not going to use. Um, but I can't make slides. I have no idea how to make slides. And the person who made them for me was traveling, and I'm like, ah, fuck it, I'm going to leave them in, and we're just going to skip over them. So today, we're going to skip over all the stuff that I did for SPF, and we're going to use the stuff that I didn't talk about at SPF because you need to be okay with not everything being perfect because that doesn't matter. My book being perfect matters to me. The slides, you're going to forgive me. You're going to grant me some grace. So find those places in your life where things don't need to be perfect because not everything needs to be perfect and concentrate on the things that you really care about. Um, all right, so he said... Don't push that button. So now that button's like, ooh, push me. Um, <laughs> all right, so you are the mountain. Um, these are the things that I'm going to zip through that I talked about at SPF. If you didn't go to SPF, go next year. It's a ton of fun, really, really great. Um, I talked about why I'm qualified to talk about getting out of your own way and why I'm qualified to talk about misbelief. Um, so I'm not going to explain any of these. You just have to imagine your own story. Um, Really great story. You would have loved it. It was really a lot of fun. Um, yeah, most interesting point that I made, absolutely. Um, so here we go. This is the book that's going to make me rich. Um, <laughs> so this is me, finally. Um, to, to round that up, I was, my misbelief drove me so hard um, that I needed to be invisible. I absolutely needed to be invisible, um, which is why I was a book coach and a uh, a uh, script doctor and a uh, ghostwriter because I absolutely needed not to be seen. Um, and I didn't think about putting my name on my books. It was after James um, interviewed me for the SPF podcast and my publisher said, why don't we put your name on your books? Um, at that point, three months ago, I was 58. That's how long it took me to put my name on my books. And I'm telling you, I've written a lot of books, I've made a lot of money, and I couldn't do it because I needed not to be seen. And I'll tell you why. Lots of books, lots of books. This is how I did it. Yeah, he was a <laughs> shitty guy. I ignored him. He was a surgeon. He thought he knew everything. Um, this is a learnable craft. This is a section about you can learn this craft. It does not need to be perfect the first time it comes out of you. Write the shitty draft, then edit, then rewrite, then learn, keep studying your craft. So I did a bunch of pictures about, oh, this is the brain. This is what we currently know about the brain. There is a lot that we know about the brain, and it's pretty complicated. And I am so jealous of the people who are 20 years younger than me because you are in this wildly exciting time where we are finding things out about the brain that are entirely not intuitive uh, and turn things on their head. And you're just heading... I mean, as long as the, the robots don't rise, it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, Oh, yes, we are going to talk um, about you being the main protagonist of your life. We're going to talk about that. All right. So before we get to who are you, which is very, very important. Um, all right. Nope. That comes later. I was up all night. All right. Um, so I put a trigger warning in the main room, but not everybody, of course, goes and reads the main room. So this is a trigger warning, and if you need to leave, please leave, um, because I'm going to talk about childhood um, sexual assault. So if that is not something that you can hear right now and you need to take care of yourself, please go. If it is something that you can hear about right now, take care of yourself afterwards if this is something triggering for you. Um, so this is why I needed to remain small and invisible and absolutely not have anybody see me at all. Um, I was seven and my brother was five and uh, we were raped by a babysitter. That's not the bit that made me need to be small. 
So um, my parents came home from wherever they'd been, and the next door neighbor said, oh, Betty, you don't want to know. And she didn't, so we never talked about it, ever. Um, and my, the story, so how misbelief works is something happens, you've got skin in the game, you care about the outcome of this thing, and your brain makes meaning from that thing. And the meaning that I took from my mother not wanting to know that I'd been raped by a 24-year-old man when I was seven was, I need to be invisible. I need to be small. And that my brother took a... Com I got his permission to talk about this, so I'm not I'm talking out of school. Um, he went the other way. He started acting out. He started collecting sticks, um, which, you know, we never unpacked. My father would just throw them on top of the garage until the garage roof almost collapsed. Um, and then he started acting out, and then he um, took up drugs. And then um, there, there was a, a time when we were walking out. It's a beautiful, beautiful night. And by this time, I am the super goodest girl you've ever met in your whole life. I follow all the rules. I don't break any of the rules. Um, in, if you know anything about English schools, I'm head girl. I, I am like super duper, like keeping myself as small as I can and as obedient as I can. And my trauma responses are freeze fawn. So I will either disassociate and stop being in that present, or I will super try and make that person like me and say like lots of nice things to them and then feel shitty about myself. Um, my brother went a completely different acting out kind of a way. Beautiful, beautiful snowy night. The moon is out. It's crisp. And he says, and at that point, he's about, he's probably 15 at that point. Um, and he's doing, probably at that point, he's doing heroin at that point. Um, and he turns to me and he says, you know, tonight's a really good night to go out. And we're going dancing, but I absolutely know what he means because we just have part of our makeup is suicidal ideation. Part of them, and suicidal ideation is different from suicide. So one of my best friends is like, if you think about suicide a lot of the time, do you actually want to die? Or do you want this circumstance to end? And usually, if you're not all the way there, because by the time you get there, you're not really talking about it. If you're talking about it, you want something to end, and he wanted something to end. And so um, we went to this dance, and at some point I lost track of him, and I sent people into the, the men's room. I'm like, go find my brother, go find my brother. We can't find him. We search and search and search, and I know what's going on. I absolutely know what's going on. Um, and we go to the police station, and we're like, is he here? Has he, because he'd been arrested quite a few times by then. I'm like, is he here? And they're like, no, did you go home? Like, why the fuck would I go home? I wouldn't go home. I wouldn't tell those people anything. Those people didn't want to know when I was seven and he was five. Why would I say anything to them? So we searched until about four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning, I'm like, oh, fuck it, I go home. And by then, my brother had taken a freezer knife out of the drawer in the kitchen, and he had slashed his arms, and he had daubed my parents' bedroom door with his blood, and he was bleeding out on the bathroom floor. So we uh, got an ambulance, and he was taken in. Obviously, he was sectioned. Um, I don't know what they call it in America. Anyway, it's a, a mental hold. Um, and we had family therapy. Oh, my God, isn't that fun? <laughs> isn't it fun when you've got parents who don't want to talk about anything? Um, and so I, um, one of my things also that comes from this trauma is that I am compelled to tell the truth all the time. I am a massive blurty truth teller. It is like a compulsion coming out of me. Um, and also, one of the things my mother used to say to me quite often was, oh, Missy, you think you're so clever, don't you? Um, and I was 26 when I said, I'm so sorry, I think I might be. Um, <laughs> At that point, I had a, a BA and an MA from Oxford University, which my father told me would be wasted on me. Um, so we go in, family therapy, and um, this stupid fucking therapist, because I'm like telling stories and telling truths and saying things, and he said, you know what? I feel like I could just hand things over to you. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. Now shit's gonna hit the fan. And uh, my brother stays in and he makes friends with other people and he's talking to invisible characters and he's like, just because they're imaginary doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, so he's having quite a good time away from us and my parents were livid, they were furious. Why would you wash the family dirty laundry in public like that? So you know, at this point I'm 17 and I'm getting the same messages, the same messages, shut up, shut up, stop it, be quiet. 
be small. And so I learned to be small and as invisible as I possibly could. And I will go back. I'm not going to touch the buttons because he said don't touch that button. Go back to I am 58 before I put my name on my own book, even though I'm making a living as a writer, because my foundational misbelief is I must be as small as I possibly can. I must make no waves. I must not say these forbidden things out loud which is part of the reason that I decided to do this today. It's like, all right, I absolutely want to break this silence forever. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so um, I, I went to my, my group. I've got a great group of people around me now. Um, and I went to, to people just before SPF, and I said, what is in your way? Tell me about your foundational misbeliefs. Tell me what's in your way. And listen to what they told me. There's so much beautiful frankness. Um, Truth-telling is my number one strength, so shocking. Um, so a few weeks ago, I asked my circle of friends what stood in their way of doing whatever they felt called to do. I feel called to do this, or what they wanted to do, and here's the list. Um, so just as a side note, um, for some kinds of trauma and illness, you need help. You need help from a professional. You can't think you're aware of that. All of the stuff I'm gonna talk about, about flipping the script and, and thinking different kinds of thoughts and retraining your brain and the plasticity of the brain. Um, certain kinds of PTSD and CPTSD, you actually need somebody to help you through that. It's just gonna take longer. It's possible to get through it, but it's just gonna take longer. Um, here's the list. My asshole brain. Imposter syndrome, overthinking, anxiety, spirals, so much to worry about in the world. FOMO, busy stuff. Duty, if it doesn't pay the bills, it's a hobby. Time, day job, children's, parents, spouse, someone else. Oh God, I need to delegate. Wow, I have imposter syndrome. So these are all the things that are getting people's way. And so that's one layer, but that's not the misbelief layer. So I got, these, I got permission from all of these people to share their stories. Um, before I set the, so Susan's story, um, in England, when you go to the seaside, there's a, a kind of uh, candy that's called rock. Does everyone know what the rock is? It's a stick of, of very, very bad, not very tasty candy. Um, and generally, it's, it has a word on the inside. So it might be the, the name of the resort. So it would be Brighton Rock. Um, and you kind of get it and take it to people. And the word is all the way through this rock. It is literally, as you keep eating it, it keeps saying Brighton, 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 Brighton. Um, so this is very good for the metaphor that she made. Imposter syndrome running through me like a stick of Brighton rock, coupled with a magpie brain and a lifetime of what I called the second angel narrative. This is absolutely the perfect foundational misbelief. Listen to this. Long story short, when I was five, I was, oh, so I'm going to cry. <laughs> I was cast as a second angel in the nativity play. First angel was blonde, blue-eyed, and the parents were on the PTA. I stood in for her when she was sick, and I was told by my teacher that I was the best. But on the day of the performance, Blondie returned, and she claimed her spot. Bitter? Yes, I was. But all my life, there has been proof that I will always be second angel. It's a hard belief to shake. So she, at five, believed that she was second angel, and now that's the lens through which she sees the world. She sees the world and she is looking for evidence that she is second angel. The brain is a filtering organ. You don't actually see everything that's going on because there's, there's millions of inputs coming at you and your brain is trying to keep you alive. So mostly it's like, ah, yeah, let's not take that in. So you take in what you look for, where your attention go, where your energy goes, your attention flows. You must, must must read this book because reframing how you look at the world, reframing it so you're not looking for evidence that you are the second angel is really important because she could turn that around because she's not second angel. She was the fucking best. Her teacher said she was the best. She could have taken that away, but she didn't. 
because she got pulled back and there was no one there to say to her, you are fabulous and you are not the second angel because, you know, we don't really grow up fast enough to have kids. I, well, sorry, some of you do, of course, but some of them don't, right? All right, so that lens, how you look at the world. Let me read you another one. I'm going to ask people, so get ready because I'm going to ask you to come up and talk about your fundamental misbeliefs and then we're going to talk about how to flip the script. Um, these are just great. All right, John. After half a century, hating myself isn't just a habit. It's become a way of life. Hating myself. Are there ways, even small ways, that you can not, capitalize, not hate yourself? I realized a while ago that all the people that made me crazy like all the people in my life that I'd inherited this awful self-killing ideas from, are gone, dead and gone from my life. And I kept wondering, who was I trying to impress? Just myself. 10 year ago me was just trying to get through his days, and today me is trying to run a library and a publishing business and not doing an awful job of either. So progress, right? That is somebody who is tapping into their misbelief and starting to turn it around, starting to recognize my fuck shit brain has lied to me all this time and it is not true that I should kill myself like they made me believe that I should and maybe, so this is one of the ways that you get your misbelief to turn around is you have a counter argument. You take your brain to court and you lawyer the fuck out of it. Like, is that true? Do I have any other counter evidence? And I've been really lucky in the last few years. Um, so, so the pandemic as a writer was quite good to me because I had lots of writers come into my orbit who reflect something different back to me. They don't reflect back, well, I mean, yeah. So, so I made films for a while, um, and by then my father was dead. My father died very young. He died when he was 52. And my mother went to my first film, um, which won, if you know anything about films, it went to 82 festivals in the world, um, and it won something like 18 prizes, which is a lot. Yay! Um, and so, <laughs> so nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, and my, mom, my mother went to see it, and she said, yeah, not my cup of tea. Um, and that's what she said for, for everything that I did everything, and my brother, bless him, he was in his 30s, and he'd written a poem, he's enormously talented, can't get to the page, absolutely can't get to the page, and he'd written a poem, and he gave it to her, because God forgive, I just, he gave it to her, and she read it, and she said, yeah, I don't like doggerel, um, they were jealous of us, we didn't know that then, but I know it now, that our parents were jealous of us. Okay, I'm going to read you one more misbelief. Are you getting the idea? Can you hear how foundational this is and how it affects everything and how it makes you see the world and how it makes you scan for evidence that fit in with this misbelief and bolster it? Are you seeing that? No. Shit. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, so uh, this writer asked not to be named. I'm currently dealing with everyone hates me, everyone thinks I'm a bother, I've said the wrong thing. Anxiety. Right now, it's so bad, I even think one of my closest friends isn't responding because she's done with me. She's at work. I know this logically, but that doesn't stop the voice that says to unsend the message. The biggest issue, though, is that I need to ask for expert readers, but if I can't get past my closest friend hating me, then how can I expect a stranger to be willing to help me? My publisher is waiting for this book, and I can't expect him to keep being so understanding, because if I don't get it to him soon, he's going to hate me. She's making this story about all these people hating her. Also, I've been staring at the blue arrow for five minutes, fighting the urge to delete this whole thing, because clearly Kate will also hate me for being so forward as to comment on her post. I asked for comments. These misbeliefs absolutely run us. They run us and they make us do things that are not in our own self-interest. Um, and so what do you do? You take your brain to court. Um, if you find that you are 
um, alert to some kind of um, outrage. So you're angry or you're pissed off or something's got you. So it's a word that I don't like and it's a word I don't prefer to use, but that's literally when you're triggered. Uh, and when you're triggered, you are not self-regulating and you need to learn how to self-regulate yourself self-regulate, bloody hell. You need to learn how to regulate yourself. So ways to regulate yourself um, are um, cold water to the wrists or the neck literally sends a message to the sympathetic nervous system to cool down. Um, walking is a great way to get yourself out of your head. Pretty brisk walk to get your heart out and get out of your head. Um, we are the only mammals who have stopped shaking ourselves. So you know when you see a dog that gets up and it shakes itself, that is, it, my therapist calls it the wiggles. It's a really, really great way to get yourself out of your head and back into your body. And what you really need to do as writers, as creatives, um, is to get the logical side of, you know, Plato, bless him, fucker, um, you know, is it talked up logic and talked down emotion. But for the creative side of your brain to be freed up, you need the logical side of your brain to quiet down, which is why you shouldn't write and edit at the same time. They are different functions of your brain. And the more the logic side, the more the critical side, the more the misbelief side is saying these things to you and correcting things as you go, the smaller this gets. The window for creativity gets smaller and smaller. So you really need to get out of your misbelief, get out of your own way, learn how to calm yourself down when you're triggered so that you've got more creative space to do more of the stuff that you love. All right. So, I'm so scared. All right. Um, so then my question is, you've got hold of your misbelief, you're talking it away, you're recognizing what it is, and you're deciding who you are. And what I want you to be is the main protagonist of your life. I do not believe that most people in the room, in this room, are the main protagonist in their life. Um, they, are, they are beholden to other people. And I believe in society. I love society. I, I love order. I, I'm not saying that we should all be you know, psychopathic assholes who only care about ourselves. But I am saying, I said this yesterday, every single day when you wake up, choose you first. It's the old, you know, put the oxygen mask on first. Find a way for you to do the things, all that list of all the things that get in the way, find a way to quiet that down and stop it and choose you and make you the main protagonist of your story. Um, I don't know that anybody actually wants to be Napoleon, but... Mm. not going to see all the pretty pictures. I don't know what happened. My, uh, my computer went off. Oh, yes. Yeah. Whew. So which Napoleon do you want to be? <laughs> Are you a superhero? I don't know. Should be, right? Who's your favorite character? Think about your favorite character. What kind of attributes do your favorite fictional characters have I mean, God, they were complicated, weren't they? Great show, but so complicated. They really did that really well. Um, yeah, no. Mm. You can see where I'm going. <sighs> Mr. Darcy. This is, if you haven't seen Green Wing, it's a British show. It's completely da-da. There's no plot. I wish I'd written it. More Mr. Darcy, sorry. Lizzie too. I mean, you know, we're not picky. Right? Who are you? Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's all about who are you, making yourself the main protagonist of your story, getting rid of all these bullshit misbeliefs, choosing you. Um, yeah, are you the main protagonist of your work or is work your boss, your kids, your duty? Are they the boss of you? How do you create a circle of me? Um, the other thing that you need to do if you're going to get out of your own way is to have the people around you. Um, it turns out that there are four kinds of praise. 
there is enthusiastic praise, which is, you did a great job, well done. Then there's mediocre praise, which is like, yeah, oh, was that you, really? Then there's really like a, a critical praise, which is, I had no idea you could do that. And then there is ignoring you, which is, God, I really need a beer, which is true. Um, of those four, it turns out that the only one that actually works to help you do anything at all is enthusiastic praise. All of the other three have your amygdala start firing up. The minute somebody bops you on the nose and says, that was really good, but you start going into anxiety. And when you start going into anxiety, your creative brain starts shrinking, your memory closes down, and you go into one of the five Fs. All right, we're skipping these because I didn't do anything about the five senses. They're really important, use them. <laughs> um, this is what sound looks like in water. So these are notes. These are what notes do in water. What you say to yourself and how you say it really matters. Every time you say, I am a stupid blah, blah, blah. I am a lazy blah, blah, blah. Um, I've been training my friends around me to, to correct themselves. Every time they talk themselves down, we flip it. You've got to flip that narrative and talk yourself up. Um, the other day, I was sitting with a bunch of writers, and Dan Wood, who's just fabulous, um, he was sitting beside me, and I said, yeah, when I first joined, um, I, I was a book coach for Author Accelerator. They had you write about what was your big dream, you know, if you could have your book be anywhere, where did you want your book? And I said, and my stupid dream was I want my books in Costco. And Dan, who um, has been a friend for a while now, said, if I could clone Kate and I could just have Kate sit opposite Kate, she would tell you to say, it's not stupid. I'm like, oh, did I say stupid? <laughs> It's a, it's a work in progress. You catch yourself, you rewire it. So the neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more you take back the things, the bad things that you say about yourself and replace them with good things that you say about, you create neural pathways. It is simply not true that the brain stops growing. The brain keeps on growing. It turns out that you can, that, like, there was a great, yeah. There's a case study in here. Ah, shit! Oh, okay. Um, yes, you can gaslight yourself. Um, this is how your people should feel about you. Um, these are my dogs. I can do no wrong. I am a goddess to my dogs. This is how your people should feel about you. If your people don't feel like this about you, fucking get new people. They are not your people. If they are not enthusiastic praise, get new people. He thought I was all of creation. Yeah. All right. Live the love. No, no. Live the life you love. Love the life you live. I always wanted a library. I have a couple of libraries. Um, I'm writing things now that I completely love writing. And, uh, and I believe that you've got this. Bitch. Um, all right. So I want people to come and talk to me about their misbelief. And how we can turn it around. You can take, oh, fuck, you know, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. You can have a magic notebook or you can have a magic writing rock um, and we are going to work through misbelief. All right, misbelief always starts with I am. That doesn't sound like it's on. Can you see if it, it's on? I'm pretty sure this one's live. Do you want to replace it with this one? Yeah. So mine is, I have to do everything absolutely perfectly, and at the same time, nothing I've ever done has ever been good enough. I've never actually felt proud of anything I've done. Excellent, yet. excellent. So that's the next layer up. That is a function of your misbelief. So that is the result of your misbelief. The misbelief is always, I am. And it sounds to me like... I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, you name it, you have to name it. Oh, yeah, I am not good enough. Mm. So what do we do about that? 
every single day when you get up and you do, um, one of the things to retrain your brain is to um, every morning, every night, three things that you're grateful for. It retrains your brain. Look for things you're grateful for. For you, in addition to the three gratitude things, you get up every day and you say, what? How do you flip that script? Tell me what you're going to say. What I am going to ask. I'm great. Oh. <laughs> yes. Go, go, go. I'm horrible. Why are you horrible? Can you tell me? You don't have to. You can just stick with that if you don't want to. I'm not, I'm not special. There's nothing special about me. Mm. You're special. So every day, every single day, you get up. And in addition to your gratitude work, you say, I am special. And then you're going to add in an action. So this summer, I started taking myself out for tacos every Sunday. I'm buying myself a bunch of flowers because I'm worth it. You're worth it. You're special. Come and get your prize. Next. Let's do it. I am incompetent. I cannot do anything myself. It always has to be redone and fixed. Mm. Is there anything that you can look at in your life that you have done that didn't require to be fixed that you could argue against that misbelief with? I bet you can. Did you dress yourself this morning? Yes. yes. Start really small. If your misbelief is that big and you can't get out of, I've never done anything, I've never done anything, just look. You fed yourself, you clothed yourself, you are absolutely competent. You wake up every morning and you tell yourself you're competent and then you do a thing that you just stretch your skill set a bit and you do it and then you celebrate the fuck out of it. Good job. I don't know if you can fix this one. This is super transparent. So when I was like first or second grade, I had the kids tell me that I could not play tag with them because I wasn't, because I was ugly. So my whole life, I have been, you know, it's, it's the hair, the makeup, the working out, just trying to be enough to present myself to society, let alone all of this writing stuff. Okay. <laughs> so, so one, can you hear how bullshit it is? Can you hear how bullshit the actual words that they said to you are? You can't play tag with us because you're... The kids wouldn't let me play tag, but that's because I don't actually know how to talk to kids. Um, it's an absolute bullshit, bullshit thing. You are ontologically enough as you are, and you're going to need to take... That's so big, you're going to take really small steps that are self-loving. And even if all you can do is say you know what, my hand's not bad. Just start really small, and then little piece by little piece, reclaim your body. You absolutely can do it. Don't go too big, because you'll freak yourself out and shut down. Um, you really don't want to re-traumatize yourself around that, and you really could. So start really small with something that you think is maybe OK, and build from that. Good luck. Thanks. I am terrified to put myself out there on social media and let everybody know that I'm a writer, so I don't. And it literally says author, nothing else. So that's a function of your misbelief. I'm terrified to tell people why. What is it about you? What is it about yourself? What is it about you that you don't want people to see? I'm afraid that They'll roll their eyes like I'm just not, like I'm probably a terrible writer. I am a terrible writer. Is it true? No. Good. It's not true. So every morning you get up, I am a great writer. If that's too scary and it freaks you out or you shut down, you go with, I can write and you build, but you do it every single day. You build that muscle. Your brain is a muscle. Train that brain. We've got three minutes. Go, 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 go. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. We've got magic rocks, we've got the, oh, um, we've got a little bit of Jane Austen lavender, it's the last one. <laughs> yeah. um, I was kind of trained by my parents that any time I opened my mouth, it was not correct. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that every one of my opinions is wrong, mm -hmm. and my decisions. Mm. Do you have any people around you who can help mirror back to you that your decisions and your opinions aren't wrong? My daughter. 
awesome. Work with her. Do some mirroring work where you say something and she says, that's great. What I'm hearing you say is this and I love it. You can do it by yourself. You can literally do it in a mirror, but you're going to build that muscle of, my opinions are great. I am okay. I am fine. Good job. Thank you. I'm not worthy. Mm. In what ways are you not worthy? Well, um, when I thought about it, I remember this time when I was about five. Peter Pan was my favorite Disney film. And uh, we were playing Peter Pan in the playground, and I really wanted to be Wendy. But no, I was told I had to be Michael. So that's bullshit. You understand that that's complete bullshit, right? So you, you fight back against that, and you're going to need to Wendy your life up. I don't know what Wendy means to you, but that I'm going to guess that there's some kind of magic in there that we can... Um, maybe we'll, I know who Zoe is. Um, we can talk later about how you Wendy up your life and tell yourself that you absolutely are worthy. You are worthy. Thank you. Are you hearing how deep this shit is? Are you just hearing how sad it makes people? It makes me insane. Hello. Um, my misbelief is that I am overconfident and egotistical. Oh, fantastic. I love it. <laughs> so, so this is, um, so misbelief comes from Lisa Cron. Lisa Cron wrote Story Genius. She tried to take the old idea um, of the hero's wound, which generally was about um, kings and princes and emperors, and it was hubris. And hubris would bring them down, so they were overconfident. Why is it a problem to be confident? What's going to happen if you're confident? I don't know. Embrace the fuck out of that. Embrace the fuck out of that. Yes. Encourage her. You are not confident. Yes. Um, you can do it. That I am not trustworthy and I'm a burden disappointment to everyone. Do you have anybody that you know for a fact that you're not? You're okay. You're doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anyone in your life that you know that you're not a disappointment to? Yeah? Yeah. Lean into that. Really lean into that. Tell them. Tell them what you need and have them speak words of affirmation back to you. That wound is very deep, and I really honor you for sharing it with us. Thank you. You are worthy. All right. We're, they're going to turn the cameras off, but we've got, we're going to do one more. That's all we can do. But people can come and talk to me. Yes. Uh. It's a, actually just a question. Yes, sir. Is your brother still alive? My brother is clean and sober, and he has, um, <laughs> yeah, he is um, a drug rehabilitation counselor, um, and he builds um, centers for people to get clean and sober. Yes. And he's a wonderful human being. Wonderful. All right. Buy this book, believe in yourself, turn your head around, and don't talk shit about yourself. <laughs>